Good morning, Cross Point. Um, my name is Daniel Law. I'm one of the ruling elders here. Um, Scott is away preaching at another church, um, blessing them with his uh, talents this morning. And so I get the privilege of uh, opening the word this morning with you and uh, seeing what God has for us. So uh, as we begin, as we usually do during our corporate time, um, I'd like to give us some time to just bring our hearts and our minds before the Lord this morning. And uh, so I'll give you a few seconds to just come before him, uh, repent of things that you feel you need to repent for, um, to uh, thank him for things, and uh, just prepare your hearts to receive what we have out of God's word this morning. So we'll do that, and I'll close that time in prayer and open us up. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, I just thank you so much for this morning and this opportunity to be able to dive into your word and to just see some of the most beautiful and sweet things um, that you have for us in your word this morning. Uh, I just pray for everyone who's watching this video, um, Lord, that you would just be with them in their space, Lord, that you would speak into them, uh, Lord, that you would use my words. Um, as your words, Father, and redeem anything that is not of you. We thank you for your word, and we thank you for this time this morning. In the name of Jesus, amen. So, we've been going through uh, Philippians. Um, we chose this book in this particular time because Paul is writing, it's a very encouraging letter, but Paul's writing out of the, a prison situation in Rome where he's being held under house arrest. Um, and he's writing to a church that he planted some time ago. It's an encouraging letter. It's an intimate letter, as we've seen that in some of Scott's previous sermons. Um, it's unique. And uh, it's just been something that I think speaks into our limited mobility, our limited freedom during this pandemic time, but also some of the things that God calls us to uh, and encourages us with. So last week, Scott spoke about uh, what well, he um, preached out of chapters four uh, verses, chapter four verses eight through nine, um, which, as you will crawl, recall, Paul is exhorting, uh, reminding us and uh, his his audience at the time to set our hearts and minds, um, our internal spaces, on things true, honorable, just, pure, lovely, and commendable. Christ being the prime example of that, and also the one who empowers that in us. Um, something perhaps not too dissimilar to what many of us have at times experienced during this pandemic. Um, so uh, this morning we'll be turning to the next four verses. So if you will um, read with me um, chapter 4 verses 10 through 13. This is the word of the Lord. I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at length you have revived your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. Not that I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. This is the word of the Lord. So, this morning, I want to briefly review um, and set the context of this passage and then unpack three things. Uh, Paul's joy, Paul's contentment, and Paul's confidence and see how that applies to us and how we engage with that. So, review. The letter from Paul um, to the Philippian church um, is one that is... The story of the Philippian church, I should say, um, is recorded in Luke 16. Um, and we, were, we find vignettes in the beginning of the church, the stories that, that are there that, that Luke records of uh, Lydia, who is a, a rich cloth merchant. 
a fortune teller slave girl who's like at the bottom of, of uh, the socioeconomic strata, and a jailer um, who has authority to, to jail. And, and um, it, it's a church that began with a large uh, um, kind of different strata, socioeconomic strata. The people in this church have been aware um, firsthand, they've seen, and they've heard the stories told over and over again of what Paul left. Um, and what he left was not uh, just a community of believers, but a community of believers that knew God. Um, they knew the power of God, and they considered Paul as dear for his suffering and his faithfulness to them. They joined him once he left, planted the church, nurtured the church, and he moved on to other locations to do likewise. They joined him in his ministry as he moved away. So they financed a lot of what he did later. They are precious people to him, and likewise, he is precious to them. And we see that, and we've seen that um, as we've read through Philippians. So Paul is in Rome. He's under house arrest, waiting a verdict uh, or trial. We're not exactly sure of the exact timeline. He's with Timothy. And in Rome, it's important for us to know house arrest and... and um, being detained by the Roman authorities was something that you had to stay in a location. Um, the conditions uh, are not necessarily known, but you were expected to take care of yourself. So if you had resources, it wasn't so bad. Maybe it was like quarantine in a nice house, in a nice place, and they deliver food to you. Um, if not, you might be in the slums, and you're not being taken care of very well, um, and it's a miserable situation. You might out, even out of that situation say, you know, I'm guilty, let's move on, or, or something like that. But we find Paul under house arrest. Um, the church in Philippi has heard of Paul and Timothy's needs, and they have sent resources via um, this individual, Epaphroditus. So the occasion of Paul to write this letter is one where uh, Epaphroditus has brought these resources, he's brought the stories, the news, and he will now return with this letter to Philippi um, with, a, with a profound, and what this really, this letter in general is, is a profound thank you, and we see some of that um, this morning. But he has heard all the news, Paul has heard all the news from Philippi, the good stuff and the bad stuff, and Paul has reason to celebrate, he has reason to exhort, We've seen some of that, and he has reason to encourage. This morning's passage, I want to focus on Paul, Paul's, uh, his bounding joy, his contentment, and land on the secret of his confidence and how that applies to us. So joy, contentment, and um, confidence, and, and the secret that that comes with, or is packed with. So Paul's joy. This letter is intimate. Um, it's uh, in previous sermons, Scott's pulled out um, some of the threads, some of the unique language that's only found in Philippians. Um, and this passage is, is kind of no different. Um, so verse 10, I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at length you have revived your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. Um, the word revived, and I'm going to focus on that in the Greek is anathalo. Um, it's a rare word. And it carries with it imagery of perennial bloom, of flowering, uh, springtime, um, blossoms, fragrance, uh, and promise. And Paul's planted something in Philippi. And here in his cell comes Epaphroditus with warm tidings, provision for their needs. And it's all a testament of God's faithfulness to him, his friends, and what may have begun as a humdum day for, for Paul is just all a sparkle, like he is overjoyed. Um, this is not just a, a, a new beginning. It's not a, a resurrection, so to speak. Um, this is a deep-rooted heart investment that comes back into bloom. Um, it's always been there. It was there last year, and it's just, it's coming back. Um, Paul is joyful and happy. Um, and I think it's important for us to distinguish those two. Um, so joy versus happiness. I find myself completing the two, so I'm going to bless you with a distinction. Joy 
is an enduring internal cultivated state of knowing that comes from being settled in who you are, why you are, and how you are. Happiness, on the other hand, is contingent on externals, like other people, places, things, and events. So joy is a deep settled thing, and happiness is, is maybe a, a spark out of that. So to give you kind of an example and, and an imagery to, to, to latch on to, when I was young, my parents did a lot of traveling. They were missionaries. They'd come back to the States, and we'd go from church to church. Um, and I have distinct memories of, of going from one location to another, maybe even going to my grandparents' house, um, where I would be on the floorboard in our in a, a Cherokee, Grand Cherokee, uh, back in the day. And, and back then, we'd have, have to wear seatbelts um, or car seats. So I would wind up on the floor um, in the back, and it was warm. Um, there was this hum. I could hear the road, and it would just, like, knock me out. Um, joy is like that. It, it's this warm, continuous, just, you know, droning, like comforting thing that, that, that you feel and know in your life. Happiness, on the other hand, um, is a bump in the road. So occasionally, you know, you're driving and I don't know if you ever felt this, but uh, you'll cross a bridge and there's kind of this kadunk, kadunk. Um, joy is like that. It's like this moment, this, 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 this point in time, this thing that happens that maybe wakes you up out of joy in a special way. Um, and so that's, if that, I hope that helps. So Paul's joy, his joy is because of the Lord's faithfulness through the years. He's experienced this. There's, there's this sound in his heart and in his mind. Um, his happiness is because of the arrival and the blessing um, and the purposed visit um, of Epaphroditus. Now, the remainder of the verse, you were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. I initially read that as like, finally, like kind of rolling your eyes, like what took you so long? Um, and I kind of want to protect us from that. How the word concerned is rendered here may may make us think Paul is being really generous, maybe. Like, you know, I knew you couldn't make it, but, you know. But the literal translation um, in the Greek, and if you allow me to kind of Tarzan the speak here, is literally kind of, you concern me. You concern for me. Um, but no opportunity. So it's like he knew that there was this long abiding concern for him, and they had no opportunity. Um... And Paul understood the obstacles. His readers understood the obstacles that kept them from, from taking care of him. Um, I don't need to expand on that. Enough said. So that's Paul's joy um, that he's experiencing. That's this long um, overtime thing. So Paul's contentment. Verses 11 through 12. Not that I'm speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low. I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. Paul's contentment is not dependent on their gift. I think that's really important, and that's what he wants to communicate to his readers. He is graciously even bending over backwards to make sure they don't feel guilt-tripped, or like they didn't do something soon enough. Like he does not want, he cares for them and he does not want them to think that, not for a minute. You know, he's not saying what took you so long. Uh, he's content in all circumstances. And they knew this. This isn't something he's having to really over convince them, but he's you know, taking time out to make sure that that's, that's understood. This is a guy who was singing in chains in a Philippian jail after being harassed, thoroughly beaten, and thrown in stocks. They saw Paul live this out. So they understand that he is, he means what he says when he says this. Um, the piece I want to pull out is this word learned. It's important in these two verses, the word, I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I have learned. I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger. 
Um, we live in a culture that frequently fails to associate uh, sort of the, the diligence and the work put into something. Um, we have a lot of before and after shots, right? Fat, fit. Um, weak, strong. And it's like, boom, boom. It's like these two moments in time and there's no communication about how far apart these are. And the promises are, we can make that time shorter or this can happen overnight. Um, so there's this fail to, to communicate uh, or grasp at times, unless you go through it, the value of the process, uh, the struggle, the time it took to get from one place to another or from one condition to another. And this is the difference between like a shortcut cliche and a struggled through grounded truth. Um, and, and, and we know what cliches are and when they're just kind of, they don't have any truth to them. Um, and at times people will say things that sound like a cliche, but they actually have the grounded truth that leads them to that, to, to, to understand it. And all they have to offer maybe is what seems like a cliche. So we have to like personally understand this. Um, so Paul's example, um, he, he's well-educated and this is really important, I think. Um, he's a well-educated man who was confronted by the risen, exalted Jesus. Um, he has every reason in it for to be like point A, point B, like overnight. And there were things that changed for him significantly in those moments. Um, but still, he had to be disciplined, discipled through good times and bad times. Even his ministry, um, there's a seven-year period between Paul's conversion experience and him making sense of it. Um, and there were things in that struggle, things that he had to give up that he formally held to that Jesus flipped for him. So Paul learned that his work, his, his purpose, his, the work that he had to do, what he had to offer to God, was crawling back up on the altar of being a living, willing sacrifice, bringing himself, making himself available to be changed by God's love, his grace, and yes, discipline. Mm, learned. So my point is, Paul's contentment did not drop in from heaven like an Apple iPhone upgrade overnight. Um, it is something that came through time. It came through experience. And God does that on purpose. We walk through struggle and we walk through discipline. Um, you and I can take some encouragement from this, I think, because here is somebody who's so learned, wrote so much of the Bible, but yet of the New Testament, but he, he too needed to walk through this learning discipleship process. Um, frequently, he is dismantling, God is dismantling something that you and I have built in our internal spaces through struggle. Um, we go through struggles and God uses those to dismantle things in us. Um, things that are taking up valuable space um, that he, God, wants to occupy, move into, and repurpose. Um, and I think that's, that, that encourages me. Um, so Paul's joy, his learned commit, uh, contentment, and now his confidence. So Paul's confidence. And I don't want things to, well, let me read the verse. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. So we're familiar with this verse. We've seen it. Um, it's used in athletic settings, gyms, ceilings, boxing matches. And it really, in that context, is very much taken out of the context. And I, I kind of want to ground it. I want to ground us back into this. Um, in those settings, I hear it communicating, I can do all my will through him who strengthens me to beat this team, uh, overcome this obstacle. Um, and out of, out of its context, it's easily su a suspended cliche. Okay? Um, a co-opted Bible verse, which uh, at best is a nod to dependence on God, and perhaps at worst it makes God out to be a vending sports drink. Um, that gets you through a game, a fight, or reps at the gym. Um, there's more here than that. Remember, Paul's talking about being without and with much, enduring extremes both of plenty and lack, hardship and ease. It's better for us to read this as, I can do all these things I just mentioned 
through him who strengthens me. So we need to like contextualize it in that way um, before we put it on a t-shirt. And it could mean either. Um, but also in the language that Paul's using, um, when he particularly says learned and um, uh, secret, right? Um, Paul is co-opting Stoic philosophers' language. Like in the Greek, there's this like Stoic language of secret and learned. Um, this sort of arrival at a place. Uh, and the Stoics were all about unaffected, not wanting for anything, not needing anything, and not being displaced by pleasure or pain. It was sort of insular. I'm strong, doesn't matter what's happening, the world's falling apart around me, but I'm calm and like totally disinterested. Um, and that was built through discipline over time. And Paul's pulling in the disciplined over time thing, and so are we. The Christian outcome, however, is not disinterested uh, aloofness. Um, it's not insular. It's something present, relational, filled with joy and contentment, uh, community, and profoundly redeemed act affections, like profoundly redeemed love and concern and care, um, engagement with those around us. So let me kind of restate the obvious. Paul's confidence is in him, Christ. Christ, who strengthens him to endure all things, hardship and ease, plenty and lack. Okay? So this is something that's coming through discipleship. Um, and it is a, a settled confidence. So hardship and ease... Um, so you might ask, to endure hardship? Yeah, I get that. But ease? What are we talking about? A um, couple examples. David in the Old Testament, um, particularly when things were easy and he was at supposedly the top of the game, um, uh, he, he committed personal sins and he committed corporate sins. Um, having Israel counted to see how powerful they were. Um, you know, his, his exchange with Bathsheba um, and what happened through that whole story. Locally, um, I'm thinking of lottery winners, um, people, individuals that like play the lottery and suddenly they have crazy amount of resources and the stories are numerous of millions of dollars back to poverty. Um, something happened in that. Um, in the Old Testament, sort of the, 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 the flip side of that is Joseph. Um, and you'll recall in the Old Testament, um, this particular story, like he sold... He's thrown into a pit by his brothers. He's sold into slavery. He's falsely accused by Potiphar's wife. He's imprisoned. And then through all of that, like he rises to prominence and is given an unparalleled power and authority. But before rising to that authority and that responsibility, God forged in him a maturity to handle and confront the grief of his past, um, to forgive and walk through that, and to be a redemptive individual for his family. All of that was learned in that crucible of everything that he went through. So the secret, the secret. The secret is not just to say the verse and to kind of claim it like some kind of incantation. Um, it's not a secret unknown to others, but it's something cultivated in each of us in the secret depths of our hearts and our relationships with the person of Christ. Um, this is something that's been cultivated in Paul over time. He has learned, he has leaned into the relationship that he has with Jesus. And he's led other people time and time again to do that as well. To honestly come before Christ, to humbly come before him. Um, even in brokenness and when things are well. Um, to invite Christ into that lonely, dark place and to see it transformed. That secret place. In turn, it has changed the Philippians, and they too share in this well-known secret. So that he's talking about something that they all share. Um, and I don't know if you've been around, I mean, been around people in, in miserable situations, not just them, but you, um, and what it generates in you. Um, I've been in some pretty miserable situations, and I wouldn't, uh, the way that I reacted to certain things wasn't so great, and I'll bury the details. Um, but in these miserable situations, there's times when we were able to look back on them 
um, as even memorable and even fond moments. Um, not because of the situation itself, but because of the company, um, the process, or the outcome um, of what you went through. Um, so how do we participate in the secret that Paul's talking about? How do we also do all things through him who strengthens us and, and understand what that means and, and participate in it? The promise of the gospel is that the lonely and dark places become places of community and encouragement um, when you let Christ in. Um, it begins in our hearts. It begins in us. And this is true for the non-believer, the new believer, and the old believer. The promise and the secret is the same. All who in faith receive Christ, who invite him in, into our secret spaces will be transformed by him. And it's not something that, you know, the work is crawling into that place. You know, at times dragging yourself in. Um, God will not drag you in, but he's always there. In the sweetest ways imaginable, and in very difficult ways, he transforms you and I in community with himself, and in community with one another. So this morning, um, I just want us to realize and to know that God is a God of now. Um, he's not just a someday in heaven kind of God. Um, the hope that we have is not just in that, it's in what he does now in our hearts and in our minds. Um, through Christ, through his ever-present, right now, Holy Spirit, we have access to deep joy, we have access to deep contentment, and deep confidence in who we are, why we are, and how we are. Um, this secret is to surrender to him. And it's something that you do in faith. It's not something that you go and climb a mountain for. Um, it is something that happens in the landscapes of your heart. And we're called to that, but we also have the privilege to do that. So I'd encourage you to do it uh, for yourself and for those around you. Um, it's, it's a wonderful privilege that we have. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for Paul and just these encouraging words um, that while things are secret, they are not secret to you and you invite us into that and you invite us to invite others to participate in that. And I just thank you for that promise. Um, and I just pray, Father, that you would help us to understand and cultivate the joy, the contentment, um, and just to abide in the confidence that Paul is speaking about and that you offer. In Jesus' name, amen. Love you guys, and I hope you have a great week.